Yeah. No, how you doing? I don't know if you remember me, I used to run a club in King's Heath. <laughs> I'll tell you what I noticed they've got, um, walking around the city centre now, I've noticed, now these are all over Britain, they've got them, uh, them pelican crossings, right? Uh, that's what they're called, aren't they, mate? You looked at me with terrible doubt when I said that. <laughs> Is that pelican crossings? Yeah. What's your name? Lee. Are you always a doubtful sort of a person? <laughs> No, OK. I'll tell you what, Lee, I'm of an age now where I say stuff and then I think, have I made that up? <laughs> and it gets really bad when you get older. I was talking to a mate on the phone. He said, I'm going to Switzerland for a long weekend, right? He said, do you know anything about it? I said, I've heard, uh, I've heard Zurich's quite nice, right? And he went, well... Uh. And I thought, Zurich, have I made that up? <laughs> and there was enough doubt in my mind for me to Google it. <laughs> and then I told a mate, and I said to this mate, yeah, I said, I ended up having to Google Zurich. And he, and he went... And I thought, Google? That, that's right, isn't it? <laughs> How do you check Google? <laughs> anyway, Lee, it is, it's Pelican Crossing, isn't it? That's right, thank you very much for your support. <laughs> Uh, the kind I'm on about is the ones where, you, you know, you press a button, you get a green man, but it only gets you halfway across. And you have to press and get another green man to do the second half. You know the ones I mean? Why not just have a green man that comes on for twice as long and walks straight across, right? Then you wouldn't need that unit in the middle. That would save a lot of money for the, for the council, right? And this has been plaguing me throughout the tour. And then about three weeks ago, I did a gig, right? And I was talking to a bloke in the audience, and I said, um, what do you do for a living? He said, oh, I work for the roads department. I said, you are just the bloke I'm looking for. <laughs> I said, why do they have them pelican crossings when you press, get a green man, then you have to press and get a second green? And this is what he said, right? And he didn't say it as a joke. He said it with an air of some authority. He said to me, oh, he said, uh, that's in case people change their minds. <laughs> So, some people, apparently, right, they get to the central reservation, then they look at the other side of the road and go, mm. actually, now I see it close up. Huh? Luckily, I have a get out clause. Unbelievable. Kind of suits me, though, the double green man. I'll tell you why. I don't, I don't like to walk very quickly, right? And I, I'll tell you for why, because... Um, now, this was only pointed out to me about 18 months ago by a female friend of mine, but apparently, when I walk over a certain speed, I develop what you might call a camp hand. Now, I don't know how long this has been going on. I'm going to try and do a demonstration. Obviously, it won't be completely natural, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it now. But um, when, when I get my speed up, watch out for the hand, right? OK, here we go. Oops, like false start. <laughs> here we go. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> now, I know that looks phony, but that apparently I do that instinctively. Now, obviously, I, I think about it all the time. But it's given me a, a very sort of a camp walk, right? Now, I had a, thanks, I had a mate, I had a mate from Edgebaston who um, was probably the campiest bloke I've ever met in my life, right? Ten times camper than me. And me and him did a, a charity walk together, right? <laughs> 13 miles for the Terence Higgins Trust. Now, just before we started the race, just for a laugh, I tied his shoelaces together, right? <laughs> Do you know he never noticed? <laughs> 13 miles. There was people on the pavement saying, careful, mate. You say, what's, what's the problem? <laughs> I was walking behind going, don't tell him. <laughs> it was a strange day out in many ways. <laughs> so, yeah, on, on that subject, actually, I did, some, uh, I did some filming, right, for a television programme. Oh, did you? Yes. <laughs> and uh, we had to spend the night in a dormitory, right? That's right, isn't it, Lee? What is it with you? <laughs> You've got to see what it's like. Don't get me wrong, you seem like a very nice fellow, but 
You've got that. Th have you ever spoken to a dog? <laughs> yes. You know, you know when you talk to a dog and they go. Like, they know something's going on, but they haven't quite got it. You, you've got that slight tilt on your head, Lee. Just enough to unnerve me. I'm right on a dormitory. I am right. Good. So we, we, we'd done the filming and we spent the night. There were six beds in the dormitory and six of us. There was me, the cameraman, and like um, four people from the television company, right? One of whom was a homosexual. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't have any problem with that at all because I thought, you know, there's five of us. I if he starts... <laughs> restrain him, you know, <laughs> until he's settled, right? <laughs> but it had never occurred to me before, but I had never before heard a gay man snore, right? <laughs> Have you, Lee? No. <laughs> That's the first thing I said you didn't look puzzled by. It turns out there is such a thing as camp snoring, right? I had no idea that existed, honestly. So we was all, there were six of us in the, in the beds, and we were lying uh, talking and stuff. He was in the next bed to me, and then we put the lights off to get to sleep. So I'm lying there for about 15 minutes, and then I hear... I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, you know, full respect to him, but I, 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 I just couldn't unclench. <laughs> anyway, that's why I don't walk fast. I think that's the point I was uh, trying to make <laughs> originally. When I was a kid, I, I ran everywhere, right? Um, I mean, I re do, do, do little kids still do that? Do they still run everywhere? They do. Good. Um, I, I thought the glue sniffing might have slowed him down a bit. <laughs> now, I don't think I walked till I was about 14. I ran everywhere, and I don't mean like a gentle jog. I ran flat out, right? I'd say to me, Mark, I'm just going to go up the shop to get a Beano, all right? <laughs> God, when I stopped, I used to go... <laughs> I still do that, actually. <laughs> Not outdoors, but I was in my flat and uh, I was leaving one of the rooms to, uh, I don't know, whatever, but I, I thought, oh, I've forgotten something. I went, I went back in. I was on my own as well. I wasn't trying to impress anybody. Not that it would be massively impressive. <laughs> yeah, I brought a woman back, you know, I thought I'd, I'll, I'll do the breaking thing. They love that. <laughs> Can I get you a Campari? <laughs> oh, But that were all, all my mates, we all ran everywhere flat out. I, any conversation you had with a mate when I was a kid lasted about half a second, right? You'd see him in the street saying, You're all right, you're great. <laughs> and this was like, this was the 60s and the 70s when I was a kid, which was a good time to be a kid. You know, there was none of these paedophile stories in the paper and stuff like that. I mean, they was around, they just couldn't catch us. <laughs> you know, with the child obesity. <laughs> There's easy pickings to be had now. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> Get a paedophile come out the house and say, Oi, fatty, sock this. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Have you got any Nutella? Some people in the front row look genuinely let down. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You looked a bit horrified. What's your name? Jean. Was it too much too soon? You look quite a moral person, Jean. Is that, is that fair? Pardon? Quite a moral person. I've got a bloody microphone. You think that would do it? Of course, if you turn out to be deaf now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel terrible. <laughs> but I'll sign the rest of the show. 
And I'm sorry, I can't return any of your drawings. <laughs> so, um, what, do you, what, what do you do for a living, Jean, if you don't mind me asking? I'm a nurse. You're a nurse? Well, that's fantastic. In the old days, they used to get applause, but not anymore. Now, <laughs> um, there's been too many sort of doctor death type nurses, hasn't there? <laughs> Also, everyone around here now is thinking, oh, I'm MRSA. <laughs> if we put all the lights off, do you think you'd glow? <laughs> so, well, that's a very moral profession. Can I, um, can I make you my sort of moral guide for tonight? You don't have to do anything, just give me, you know, the occasional thumbs up. I don't mean the sort of occasional thumbs up you do in the line of your work, obviously. <laughs> gloves. I mean metaphorical. <laughs> is that all right, Jim? If there's, if there's a joke I'm worried about, I can, is that okay? Thanks. That, that'll, that'll be good. Let me start with this one. <laughs> I've often wondered, Jean, right, if when, when a new paedophile comes to town, right, bear with me, right, <laughs> does he seek out one of the older, more experienced local paedophiles, you know? and say, where's the best places round here to, uh, to, to pick up kids, you know? And, and does the old paedophile say, well, swings and roundabouts, really. <laughs> I've got the wire with that one, do you think? <laughs> Jean's not sure. And I think I've got away with it. She's smiling. It's a good sign. I've got to tell you, I... Um, it's a bit of a test case that, that look, I did that joke at the Montreal Festival in Canada a, a few months back, and I said, uh, swings and roundabouts, and the audience went... <laughs> I don't mean one or two, I mean everybody. Now, it's very difficult to silence an entire crowd, right? <laughs> I mean, any joke can offend any person. I had a friend, and her mum and dad was killed in a car crash, swerving to avoid a chicken that was crossing the road. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine what her life was like. <laughs> I remember her storming out of the Basil Brush show. <laughs> I don't think there was any malice in the fox's remark. <laughs> anyway, I walked off stage at, at Montreal, and there was a Canadian guy in the dressing room who'd organised the whole event, and I said, oh dear. I said, they didn't like the swings and roundabouts, Joe. He said, uh, I didn't get it. I said, well, you know that saying, swings and roundabouts, like six of one, half of the other, you know, you know that saying. And he went, he said, we don't have that saying in Canada. And I thought, well, what did they think I meant then? <laughs> did they honestly think that in the middle of a comedy show, I had stopped to tell an anecdote in which a young paedophile says to an old paedophile, where's the best places to pick up kids? And the old paedophile, just tells him. <laughs> so he swings and roundabouts as a start. Oh, that's, that's most helpful. Thank you very much. Why would I do that? Anyway, let, let's move on. Gene. Before we move on, though, Pete Townsend, right? Now, Pete Townsend, as you may know, is the lead guitarist with The Who. Now, I don't know if you read about this, but he was charged with looking up child pornography on the internet. He said, I wasn't doing it for those horrible reasons. I was researching my autobiography. Which is one of the few books you think you might not need to research. <laughs> what well, have been there for all of it, right? <laughs> but I like Pete Townsend. I like The Who. He said, I cannot accept that he's one of those terrible people. I'm sure it was a mistake and that he's innocent. This is what I think happened. I think Pete was on stage one night with The Who. <laughs> and he thought to himself, you know, when I get back to my hotel, I think I'll write a little bit of my autobiography. In fact, tonight, I think I might write some stuff about um, paedophilia. <laughs> and then he thought, paedophilia? Have I made that up? <laughs> I'll Google it. <laughs> so I don't, um, I don't run now. I'll tell you why. I, I don't run much because I'm of an age now where falling over is a much bigger deal than it used to be. 
I mean, there's people now who are probably in the front row at least who fall over probably three or four times a week on the Alco Pops. <laughs> but I was talking to someone a couple of months back. I was standing on, on steps, just like half a dozen steps, and I was chatting away. And I stepped back thinking there was another step there. And there wasn't. And I, I toppled and, and over I went, right? The hand kicked in, but it, it couldn't save me. <laughs> and um, I mentioned it, it was, wasn't very spectacular, but I mentioned it to a couple of people in passing, you know, just in conversation. That week, I got five phone calls from friends, right? All along the lines of, uh, I, uh, I heard you fell over. <laughs> Are you all right? <laughs> and instead of making light of it, I heard myself saying, well, I was a bit shaken up, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's pathetic. In case you're wondering, I was 50 in January, right? And, uh, no. Now, why would you applaud that? Still alive, who'd have thought that? <laughs> I left that gap for people to say, no, that simply cannot be true, but <laughs> didn't happen. So, yeah, so, is there, is there any 50-year-old men in tonight? Where are you, mate? There's one in an Albion shirt there. The troubles are piling up, aren't they? What, what's your name, mate? Tony. Tony. When was your 50? February. 15 February, OK. So, um, did you go through a bit of a midlife crisis? Obviously, that's a little bit optimistic. Did you go through a two-thirds of the way through life crisis? You didn't? No, no. I'll tell you what I did. My, I think most blokes, you know, they, they start listening to dance music, buy a sports car, it's all a bit tragic. My thing was, I, I had a gold tooth fitted, right? <laughs> so here's that. <laughs> yeah? And, uh, thanks. Yeah, it's not the price is right, I'm not selling it. <laughs> and I thought it would make me look a bit more street, you know. So, about four days after I had it fitted, I was in this bar, uh, quite a trendy bar in the West End of London. I was meeting someone, it was early evening, and I was just sitting at the bar talking to the barmaid. It was very attractive, sort of mid-twenties. I, I could see she had no idea who I was, but I could tell she'd clock the tooth, right? And I thought, well, she's probably thinking, you know, he's a bit of a hip-hop dude. <laughs> and then after about three minutes, she said to me, do you work on the waltzers? <laughs> Don't you dare applaud that. <laughs> I, no. I was gutted. Now, that's what happens when you start to get older. It doesn't happen to be just little things, little incidents, and you think, oh, shit, I'm getting old, right? I had my hair cut, right? I went to this hairdresser. I'd never been there before. I didn't know the bloke. He cut my hair. It looked all right. He said to me, uh, do you want me to do your ears as well? <laughs> well? What do you say to that? Yeah, can you leave them quite long on the lobes? <laughs> and um, I'll have a number one crop around the actual <laughs> hole, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, 50 is like a big milestone. You really overreact when you get to 50. You start acting like you're 80. So I've started thinking like an old person. I did the sound check here tonight, you know, before, obviously before you arrived. And I have to come upstairs, there's like a few stairs at the back of the stage there, and I was thinking, best be a bit careful with it. <laughs> I don't know what my friends now refer to as one of my falls. <laughs> I was thinking, Tony, I might get one of them, them buzzers you can get, you know, in case, in case you fall and you're not found. Obviously, I'd be a bit pissed off if I fell tonight and was not found. <laughs> People leaving saying, oh, he was all right. I didn't like the ending much, did you? <laughs> was it some sort of Tommy Cooper homage? <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> oh, there goes my 25 minutes of Princess Diana material. <laughs> And the other thing is, when, when I got to 50, I thought, I better start looking after myself now. So I thought, shall I join a gym? And then I thought, no, no, I'll get some multivitamins. <laughs> so I went to the supermarket, and there's loads, right? But I saw some, and they're called 50 plus, right? And I thought, oh, I'm having you, right? <laughs> but, and this is weird, right? The thing was that when I saw them, I was still a week short of my 50th birthday. And I thought, Mm, best leave it, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, I thought the assistant might ask to see my birth certificate. <laughs> In 
Anyway, somebody bought me some for my birthday as a, what they call a comedy present, I believe. And I've been taking them since January, the 50 plus multivits. And I, I hope they're doing me good, but there is one side effect which I hadn't anticipated, right? Now, any bloke in the audience or any woman who lives with a bloke will know that in the household where a man lives, the toilet seat is often left up, right? And often on the front of the rim of the toilet, there's a bit of a, a bit of a Jackson Pollock. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Google him, Lee. <laughs> it's a bit of a squiggle of, of urine, right? It's true, though, isn't it? Jean, am I right? You're a nurse. You know about these things. Yeah. Why don't they just take a single sheet when, it, when, it's, when it's wet and just blot it away? But they don't. They leave it until it takes on a sort of a lemon curd consistency. <laughs> As if they're going to come back and apply glitter. <laughs> so anyway, I, always, I live alone, so I always have the squiggle on the front of the rim of the toilet, you know, apart from Thursdays when the cleaner comes and uh, she just peels it off like a price label. <laughs> but it's still there on the toilet, but honestly, since I've been on the 50 plus multivits, it's there, but it glows in the dark. <laughs> in the dark. It's done something to my urine and made it luminous. I don't know why. Honestly, if I wake up in the middle of the night, it's like there's a little runway <laughs> between my bed and the ensuite, <laughs> formed by dozens of slightly dribbly return journeys. <laughs> and the rug, you know the toilet rug that fits around the front of the... Oh man, you should see my toilet rug. <laughs> It's like flying over Vegas. <laughs> and, and like all blokes, I get the stainage. I mean, every bloke gets the stain. You, you can't, actually, you can't help that. You, no, really, you can shake it until it bleeds. <laughs> it's like there's some sort of secondary torrent that comes. I, I don't know, I understand the mechanics, but you can't avoid it. So I've got the patch. Now, it's completely fluorescent, right? If, if I went jogging at night, wearing just my pants, right, I reckon in a rear view mirror I could be mistaken for an approaching motorcycle. <laughs> I said earlier that I, uh, I ran everywhere as a kid, right, that wasn't strictly true. I, I, I spent quite a lot of time as a kid doing this. <laughs> I mean, for miles, right? And um, I was playing cowboys in case you, people look genuinely, what, what's he doing, right? I played, any, who, who played cowboys here as children? <laughs> nobody, nobody in the West Midlands, yeah. There was a woman over there who played cowboys, fantastic. That's, I bet you didn't play cow, I bet you did dressage. Man, we loved it. We loved the cowboys. And I loved it so much. When I got to about 35, I'd stopped by then. I, I, uh, I thought I'm, I'm going to learn to ride you know, a proper horse. So I booked, um, I booked a lesson at this riding school. And uh, I turned up. Oh, God, I'm knackered from doing the horse riding. <laughs> uh, I turned up there, and the bloke, he wasn't very friendly. And I think he thought, oh, you know, city boy. He, he, you know, he shouldn't be doing this. He said to me, uh, he said, there's the horse, put that saddle on it, I'll be back in 10 minutes. First lesson, right? So he went off and I thought, I'm going to show him, right? So I picked the saddle up. The horse looked edgy, but it's all right. I put the saddle on. Now, under the, 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 the saddle thing, there's, there's a strap called the girth, right? And that holds the whole thing in place. You have to get it very tight, right? And I pulled it and I got it tight, but not quite tight enough. I was... It was like a whole short, you know, which can ruin any good night out. Maybe <laughs> squabbling. But anyway, I thought, when he comes back, I'm going to be on the horse, I'll show him. So I put my foot in the stirrup, right? Yes, you know, don't you? I didn't. And I started getting... And I went, and the saddle went <laughs> upside down and gave the horse a sort of a giant Chinese burn. <laughs> I heard the tearing of hair. It was all, and the horse, the horse sort of went. Oh, man. And um, he turned the horse. On, he turned to me like this. <laughs> and I'm 
I'm standing here, right? He's standing here. He beat me. He beat me. He beat me right there, right, right where the, the bicep should be. <laughs> and when I say he beat me, you're probably thinking, oh, I can imagine what happened, that he went... He didn't. He beat me, but he beat me really slowly, right? <laughs> it was weird. Ima imagine that's me, I'm the horse, right? So I, I've just received the giant Chinese bird, right? <laughs> so as I say, he turns like this. <laughs> and then he went... <laughs> I had ages to get out the way. <laughs> It was like I felt I owed him, you know? <laughs> and the thing is with a horse as well, is their eyes are quite a long way from their teeth. <laughs> so even while he was biting me, he was still bloody staring. <laughs> as if to say, you know why I'm doing this, don't you? <laughs> the other thing I decided I had to change when I got to 50 was my... Um, my lifestyle on the sexual front, right? <laughs> because I'll be honest with you, when I used to tour in the old days, I used to put myself about a bit. You know what I mean? I used to have a lot of one-night stands and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not proud of it. Well, I'm a little bit proud of it, I suppose. <laughs> or I wouldn't be telling you. But I... <laughs> no, but I thought, for a 50-year-old man, I'm right, Gene, it's not very dignified, is it? No, no, yeah, you're right. What does that mean? <laughs> I should be beheaded for it. That's a little hard. <laughs> No, so I've, I've stopped doing the one-night stands. I just think it's wrong for a 50-year-old man. Also, I've, I also found with the one-night stands, and there'll be people here who do one-night stands, I'm not condemning you, but don't you find this, that the, very, the very second, this is what I find, the very second I completed the act, <laughs> I wanted them to go. <laughs> I, I'd sort of be going, oh, 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 oh get out. <laughs> can't treat people like that, it's not right. I mean, maybe women are the same when they come, I, I, I've no idea. <laughs> I'm usually on the bus by then. <laughs> no, that's a lie. I don't get the bus. No, no, but it spoiled, it even spoiled the sexual bit because even when I was having sex, I'd be thinking, oh, we're going to have that awkward conversation after about her leaving, you know. And I used to be all subtle. I used to say stuff like, I must say, the local cab firms here are very good, right? <laughs> and um, I, was, I was with uh, one woman, right? And um, we'd had the sexuals, right? And, and she said to me, she said, uh, look, she said, I can't stay out all night. I've got two black labs. I said, I never noticed. <laughs> I said, was it frostbite? <laughs> now, don't worry if you didn't get that joke, right? Because she didn't either, which I have to say really annoyed me, because I was quite pleased with myself. I thought that was pretty sharp. I was still post-coital, you know, slightly light-headed. I felt I'd done well, and I said to her, I said, uh, I said, you must admit that was pretty quick. She said, it was hardly my fault. I said, I meant the joke. <laughs> and that's an interesting point, because people think that one-night stands are very unemotional, but you can still get your feelings hurt, right? I really, there was one... I, I, this really upset me now. I, I, met, I met this woman, right? And she's very nice, and we went back to my hotel room. Now, that afternoon, I'd been pottering around the town, as you do when you're on tour. I'd been into the record shop, and I'd bought a four-CD box set called A History of Black Music, right? So, we got to the, um, the hotel room. She was getting undressed. Yes. And um, I thought I'll put a bit of music on, you know, make it a bit cool and slinky. And, and black music, it'll be like, you know, Barry White, Marvin Gaye, something cool. So I took the cellophane off, put it in the hotel CD player, and then I moved towards the target. <laughs> right? And I was, I was fully sheathed, in case you're worried. <laughs> in fact, I had been all afternoon. <laughs> I took it off twice to have a piss. <laughs> anyway, I joined her in bed, and I... How can I put it? I mounted. 
right? And I wasn't fully sunk, but I was probing. <laughs> when the music kicked in. Now, the thing is with black music, it goes back a lot longer than you might think, right? <laughs> so I was just starting to find my rhythm when I heard... Da -da 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 sexy piece of music ever written, right? And you would be amazed how much it spoiled the act for me. I, I, all I could hear was the music. It really, and I tried to make the most of it. There was one point I remember when I was going da 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 rubbish. And even in the midst of sex, I said to this woman, I said, I said, I'm sorry about this. I said, I don't even like jazz. She said, it's rag time. I said, you should have said that before we started. <laughs> would clap that. <laughs> anyway, we completed the act. Well, I did. And <laughs> we was lying back. Now, after sex, I always like to um, apologise. <laughs> no, but when, when I'm with a new person like that, it's never very good because I get nervous and I know I'm not, you know, I'm not on my top form. And I said to her, I said, I said, I know that wasn't, I said, I enjoyed it, but I know it wasn't great. And this was what she said. She said, oh, don't worry, she said. My boyfriend, <laughs> already breaking one of the golden rules of a one-night stand, she said, my boyfriend has got a very big... Now, the word... No, but the word she used was a word I personally don't like. I swear, but there are some words, you know, I, it just make me squirm a bit. It was one of those. She said, um, my boyfriend has got a very big prick. <laughs> and then... As if it needed some clarification. <laughs> she said, a massive prick. I said, all right. I could smell it. <laughs> she said, and sometimes it can be quite uncomfortable, she said, so that was a bit of a relief. <laughs> feel I could ever go back at it because somehow she'd managed to frame it as a sort of a compliment. <laughs> I felt like the new lightweight tampon. <laughs> you won't even know it's there. <laughs> I think one of the, the strangest, probably the three strangest one night stands I ever had, I think, w one of them was certainly, I met, I met a woman in, in, uh, in Birmingham, actually, and we went back to her flat in, in Rotten Park. Right? I know. Um, well, I know that was a, very unusual for me because I never used to go back to their place. I would invite them to my flat or my hotel room, but I, I almost never went back to theirs because, you know, I, I, I didn't want to get murdered. <laughs> but needs must. So... She was very insistent that we went back to her. So we went back to her flat. Now, Jean, I'm going to have to give some details here because the geography of this story is quite important. But I'll keep it as respectable as I can. She took all her clothes off and knelt. She knelt on the bed, right, facing away from me, right? <laughs> and I, I stood behind, right? Remember, she's... Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> I stood behind, and we had, we had the sex from behind. Straight sex, but from behind, right? The, the, the doggy style, they call it, don't they? Yeah. When I say the doggy style, Lee, I don't mean she was going... <laughs> she made it, thing. I, I didn't pick up on it, so... We, we started having um, the, the sex from behind. And I was having a, I was having a nice time. And, uh, you know, there's young blokes over here watching every move, trying to pick up a few tips. <laughs> Note the subtle change of angle. <laughs> I find you have to get in all them nooks and crannies. <laughs> it's not unlike hoovering in that respect. <laughs> I certainly intended emptying me back. No, Jim. <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> so, anyway, it, I was having a nice time. It was all going lovely. And then, 
I saw something moving out the corner of my eye. <laughs> no, no, but th this was quite shocking, right? Because what, what had happened is a, a child had come into the bedroom. And, uh, and uh, I mean, like a two-year-old girl was standing watching us, right? Now, this woman, had t you, you remember this woman? <laughs> I'd almost forgotten her myself. <laughs> now, this woman, now, she... Uh, <laughs> she told me that she had a, a daughter, right? Uh, but I didn't think she'd be back at the flat. I certainly didn't think she'd be wandering around in the bedroom. So I panicked a bit, right? And I didn't want to say anything to the mother in case she suggested stopping. <laughs> Have you ever been having sex and you have to stop suddenly in the middle of it? Do you know what I mean? Like, you just like the, the, the doorbell goes or the, the saucepan's boiling over or something, you know. Or you just run out of money. <laughs> but, but you have to stop suddenly. You know, it's happened to everybody, I think. It's probably happened to me about five times in my life. And every time I've stopped suddenly during sex, I have never been able to resist the temptation to go, Smell a burning rubber. <laughs> now, I'd read somewhere, right, that if a child walks in on adults having sex, they can mistake it for an act of violence and, and, and be quite frightened. So I didn't want that to happen. So I, I became very worried about the child. I didn't want her to be scared, right? I mean, not worried enough to stop, but still worried. <laughs> This was what I thought, I've got to make sure she's okay. This was what I did, right? And uh, bear in mind, I was thinking on my feet. Okay. So I, um, I, start, I started going... Uh... Blue faces, right? So I'd go, uh, and, then, and then she would go, uh, back at me. and then I'd go, uh, and she'd go, uh, and we carried on like this. She was giggling away, right? The mother must have heard the giggling, must have assumed it was me. <laughs> must have thought I was there. Anyway, thank God the child got bored after a bit and left the room before I um, actually ejaculated. <laughs> I wouldn't like to look round and she was going... <laughs> I have to say to you now, this... It's a walk down memory lane for me, that, because... Um, the, the, that mime that I'm doing there, you know, it's actually, it dates the whole experience for me because I, uh, this happened a few years ago, this, this thing, and uh, now, if I have sex now with the woman kneeling on the bed, I've, I've changed my technique somewhat. But I, I've had to, and I'll tell you what, it's a weird thing. If I have, um, <laughs> I'd love to know if anyone else, but, but they, they won't tell me. <laughs> In the last three or four years, I've found if I have sex with the woman kneeling on the bed and me standing behind, I have to hold on very tightly, right? <laughs> Otherwise, they seem to draw away from me. <laughs> have you found? It's a bit like, you know when you're in a conga and it gets a bit stretched? <laughs> No, it's, it's hard, so I start, I'm, having, I'm having the sex shows, and I'm, it's going lovely. And then I look down and I think, I'm sure I couldn't see this much condom when I started. <laughs> then I realise my shins are against the bed frame, and I'm sort of, oh, oh can he hold her, Captain? And she's like, oh. <laughs> With her vagina blowing raspberries... <laughs> ..like a rude schoolboy from the back window of a departing bus. <laughs> Now, I have a theory, I don't know, uh, but this is my theory. I think it's something to do with the female mathematician, right? You know the female mathematician. Now, 
three or four years ago, the female mammalian was a taboo subject, never mentioned, but now women are much more out than they'd have to be. <laughs> and, and I find, right, that when, when I suggest having sex from behind, right, and, and I always suggest it, I, I don't just creep up on people. <laughs> hot tea. <laughs> but whenever I suggest it, there's always a look I find now in the woman's eye as if she's thinking, oh, that's a very good position for me to supplement his activities with a bit of DIY. <laughs> right? And men pretend that they like that, oh, that turns me on, baby. But in fact, it does quite hurt our feelings, right? If you're, if, sometimes you'll be having sex, you think, oh, man, she's loving this. And then you realise that you're claiming it, but in fact, it's an own goal. <laughs> And the male ego is so delicate, right? I, I've been there, I've realised it's going on, and I thought, well, you know, maybe she's just scratching. <laughs> but is that good news? <laughs> I was, um, on, this was odd. I had something on, something was nagging at me, I don't remember what it was now, but something was on my mind. And I was having sex from behind, but I was still deep in thought. And sometimes when you're deep in thought, you need both hands to think. Right? And I was having sex like this. <laughs> I looked down, I realised for the previous three minutes I had been what I can only describe as air fucking. <laughs> she was 18 inches away, I mean, well out of my range. I drew her back like sliding a bowling ball off a rack. Keep talking, Frank, for God's sake. <laughs> Gene, I can't even look at you. <laughs> and the other thing I've found with, with the sex from... Now, I think, I think most men will have experienced... I'm not even sure that women know this is going on over their shoulders, but often you start having the sex from behind and you think, well, I've still got my shirt on, right? <laughs> now, it turns... The male shirt is just the right length to collect slither. You know, during Sex From Beyond, there's a cocktail of male and female juices knocking around, and I find they tend to cling to the hem. <laughs> if... <laughs> Gene, can you just put your fingers in your ears for two minutes? <laughs> I was, um... I've lost my nerve now. No, I, I was having uh, the anals, right? <laughs> yeah. I was having the anus with a shirt on, right? Honestly, true this. And the sh it, it, it got trapped. <laughs> it honestly got... You, you know when paper gets stuck in a printer? <laughs> it was like that. Obviously, a light didn't come on, but... We, <laughs> we, we had to stop, and I had, I had to wrench it. And, I, and the thing was, I didn't have another shirt with me. I had to go out that night in the... And I've got a few stairs, I can tell you. I told one bloke I'd tie-dyed it in Bisto. <laughs> Didn't believe it for a second. But clothes can get snagged up, though. In the, uh, that's why I never have sex from behind with a tie on, because you could choke. <laughs> if that gets caught, six good thrusts, your face down in the bomb crack where <laughs> no one can hear you scream. <laughs> End up coming on your own face. Now, What I need is a sort of 32-inch bicycle clip to keep everything out of arm's way. But you can't just walk into a shop and buy one of them. They have to be bespoke. So, I, like most men, I've come up with a series of methods for having sex from behind with a shirt on. I think the most common, most of you will recognise, is the roll-up. So you started having sex and you think, oh, I've still got my shirt on. But... The thing is, sex from behind, obviously, is quite a physical activity. So after a bit, you find... <laughs> and you think, oh, no, this is coming... Whoa, come here! It's, it's like spinning plates. It's too much to think about at one time. So uh, for many years, I used that method. Now, I, I won't demonstrate this, because you don't want to see my torso. It's, it's not attractive. But I would undo the shirt, unbutton it, and hold the two sides back with my elbows. Right? <laughs> The thing is, it very much shortens the arms for holding on. <laughs> so you're having sex like this. <laughs> it's a bit like being a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> I think that's why 
why they died out. The females just slid out of range. <laughs> and also, when you're holding the shirt back with your elbows, when you do finally come, right, it all goes a bit Mick Jagger. So you sort of go... I was talking to a, a mate of mine about this anyway, and, and he said to me, he said, I don't know what your problem is. He said, when you realise you've still got your shirt on, just, you know, unbutton it, take it off, cast it to one side and carry on. A man nodding there. A bit of wisdom, wasn't it? Wise words. The thing is, you see, I wear some quite expensive shirts, and really they need to be hanged. <laughs> and I find that women notice if you start edging them towards the wardrobe. and I got right up to the wardrobe, I got the door open, I took out a wire coat hanger. The woman looked round and said, it's all right, I've got the morning after pill. <laughs> uh, I can't figure out anything I felt. <laughs> anyway, I had what I can only describe as a life-changing experience, right? I went to visit a friend and colleague of mine, David Badil. I'll tell him, I mentioned your name, five and a half thousand people, and four of them went, Wee. <laughs> I'll phone him tonight. <laughs> so I turned up at his house, right, and uh, he, he, comes, he said, uh, oh, you're, you're a bit earlier than I thought, which is the kind of warm greeting I've come to expect from him. But we went in the house, he, he got kind of, uh, you know, he got uh, jeans, T-shirt, trainers, and on, on, on his, on his T-shirt, there was a, a sort of a, there was a wet patch about here. And um, I said, what is that? What's that on your T-shirt? And he went, oh, he said, look, he said, to be honest, he said, you, you caught me mid-masturbation. <laughs> I said, um, mid? I said, surely you mean post? <laughs> and, he, and he said, uh, oh no, he said, it, it's not that. And, and this is honestly what he said, right? He said, no, no, he said, he said, when I do it, he said, I'll do this. <laughs> I thought, that's a good idea, isn't it? <laughs> so now, when I have sex from behind with the shirt on, all I do is I hold the shirt in my teeth and it, it works a treat. The only side effect I've found is that my dirty talk now sounds like it's coming from a ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> so I'm sort of going, you gucking govet. <laughs> it disturbs people more than anything. <laughs> I, went to, uh, I went to a party in... Um, in the city of London, which is, it's all offices, so at night it's deserted, right? But there's still double yellow lines everywhere, so you, you can't park. So I, I sort of got to the party, but I had to park about a mile away, right? And then I couldn't remember how to get back to the party. So I'd been using a sat-nav in the car, you know a sat-nav? And how tragic is this? I took the sat-nav out of the car <laughs> and walked with the sat nav <laughs> to the party. And it was one of those Tom Tom ones, you know, the, the, uh, you, they've reached Birmingham, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> and um, when, you, when you're driving with one of those, you've got, your, you've got like the computer map and you've got like your car is represented by an arrow and you still get the little arrow when you're walking, which is actually quite exciting. You can see yourself moving down the road. <laughs> I took a couple of turns just to make it move, right? <laughs> And this is the best bit. I got to, bear in mind there was nobody around, I got to the main road, right? And what I did, I was still watching my little arrow on the screen. I ran into the main road, just about like a foot, and then out again, and then into the main road again. And I managed to recreate the opening titles to Dad's Army. <laughs> you can honestly, honestly try it. Try it really, really works, right? And the brilliant thing about the Dad's Army song is you can sing it all the way through while you're doing it because you don't need to, you can sing it without knowing any words. It's a very weird song in that respect. You can kind of go... Everybody. 
<laughs> oh, doubt me. I had a bit of a thing with that song. I, uh, I, you know when you just accept something, you just, you just accept, you've accepted it for years, and then one day you think, hold on a minute, I'm not sure about this. I did that with that song. I, I also did it with the Elephant Man, incidentally. I saw the Elephant Man recently on Late Night Telly, right? The film, obviously, not, not him. <laughs> oh, chat show, that'd be brilliant. Blogging his new DVD, his bloopers DVD. <laughs> It's hilarious. It's <laughs> a film. And I watched the, I hadn't seen the Elephant Man film since it came out, you know, probably whatever it was, early 90s or something. And um, I was about an hour into the film when I thought to myself, you know, the Elephant Man doesn't actually look like an elephant. The Elephant Man doesn't, right? If anything, he sort of looks like fresh ginger. <laughs> Because he was in a freak show, you know, you couldn't put up posters that said featuring the ginger man. <laughs> or people would have said, well, OK, they're not the best looking people in the world, but I'm not paying to see one. It's one of our works. But I had, I had the same thing with the Dad's Army song. I, I must have heard it a thousand times, never questioned it. And then I was listening to it one Sunday afternoon, it was on recently, and it came on, you know, who do you think you're kidding, Mr. Hitler, if you think... And I thought, it's actually quite a weird subject for a sing-along comedy song, isn't it? Hitler, right? So I googled it, and <laughs> it turns out that during World War II, even though Hitler was bombing the shit out of us at the time, lots of British comedians, people like George Formby and stuff, brought out jolly sing-along songs about the Nazis, right? And the, the, the British public loved them, right? And I thought, it's a shame we've lost that. I kind of like that attitude to warfare. But if a modern British comedian brought out a jolly sing-along song about, say, the Iraq War, He'd be slaughtered, wouldn't he? If he was watching the lottery show one Saturday and they said, and now with his new single, ladies and gentlemen, Frank Skinner, and I came on. <laughs> the band strike up and I'm going, my mate Ali was a dentist, now he's a Muslim fundamentalist. <laughs> Daddy's gone bomb mad, bang bang bad dad boy. <laughs> Drove a car bomb through the cordon. Watch out, Mr. Traffic Warden. <laughs> Daddy's gone bomb mad, bang bang bad dad boy. Who'd buy that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would sell like hot cakes in Birmingham. <laughs> I'm gonna write one especially for you. Get me a little ukulele out. George Formby song about the war against terror. It would work, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't used to think I'm not a care... I am a very caring, very caring person. I did, um, I did the comic relief, right? And you know, when comedians do comic relief, they always say, uh, oh, it's very emotional, right? And it is quite emotional, but I, um, I was involved in a, in a minor incident, right? We were in West Africa, and we had to get to this village. What happened is, three years earlier, um, Comet Relief had built a, a water pump for this village, and we had to go and have a look at the water pump, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but we, we did, right? <laughs> Make sure they hadn't sold it as scrap. <laughs> Maybe not. Anyway, everybody else went. I wasn't going to stay in the five-star hotel on my own. <laughs> so we, we got to this village, right? And, and this was lovely, actually. The, the, the village people had lined up, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> they lined up, I might have been tempted, who knows? <laughs> I was on the holidays, no. The people of the village lined up and formed a sort of an avenue into the village, sort of applauding us. It was lovely, you know. And I think the idea was that we should walk down and shake hands. But I thought, I don't, I don't want to be, you know, too grand. Keep it light, I thought. So I thought I'll run down like a footballer running down a tunnel, you know. And as I say, I don't run very often. And when I do, often things go awry. <laughs> so as I, I, I was sort of trundling down like this, 
And just as you went into the village, there was a, a wooden overhang, right? Which I didn't see. <laughs> I hit my head. I'm, honestly, you know when it nearly knocks you out? It was honestly like that. It nearly knocked me out. A real bang. And the African people pissed themselves. <laughs> I had half a mind to smash that pomp to smithereen. <laughs> now drink mod. <laughs> no, obviously, looking back, it was a lovely, warm, human moment, but I'd just hit my head really hard. <laughs> really appreciate it and you know also when you I think this is true of most people if you if you do it your head hard you swear I mean people just do right and uh, it was so I sort of went oh fuck off <laughs> kind of out the world you know but, uh, and the African people all went oh <laughs> and they thought I was having a go and I went no 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 and then I laughed and then they laughed again and it was all fine Anyway, the director comes up to me after and he said, uh, oh, he said, he said, oh, I love that bit where you hit your head and they all laugh. <laughs> he said, we'll put that in the Comet Relief show on the night. And I said, well, I, I wish I hadn't sworn, you know. And he said, oh, don't worry. He said, we'll cut that bit out in the edit. But I did worry, right? Because I know things can go wrong in edits, you know. Even our own dear queen was misrepresented. <laughs> And I thought, what if they cut that bit out and then accidentally throw the other bit away and just keep that bit? <laughs> and then I'm watching Comet Relief on the night <laughs> with a few family and friends, telling them what a, an emotional, life-changing experience it's been. <laughs> Jonathan Ross comes on and says, uh, in two minutes' time, we'll be meeting Wiki Gervais, but first of all, this short film. And then it's just me going, fuck off! <laughs> And people going, oh. <laughs> and then the phone number comes up along the bottom. It, who's going to give on the strength of that? <laughs> and I'd really, I'd really tried as well, because I won't name names, but some of the celebrities, they just kind of turn up. I'd done my research, I'd been on the internet, I'd read, well, not books, magazines. <laughs> I'd read. There, was one, there was one thing that confused me. There was an advert for a, a charity, right? And it said, just 40 pounds will buy this African village a tractor. I thought, that's bloody cheap, isn't it? <laughs> I thought, as soon as I get off the plane, I'm off to the nearest Massey Ferguson dealership. <laughs> See what other bargains they've got. <laughs> that type of stuff they'll never shift, you know. <laughs> How much for the snow plough? <laughs> Five pounds, I'll give you three, okay. <laughs> In my teens, I was very impressed by that Oxfam slogan. Do you remember this? It, it went, uh, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you give him a fishing rod, you feed him for a lifetime. I had that in my mind. However, I was sent to Burkina Faso in West Africa, which is basically in the Sahara Desert, right? <laughs> so I looked a bit of a fool when I said, hey, look what I bought you. I said, the nearest water is 300 miles away. I said, just jump on the snowplow. I'll drop you off. <laughs> anyway, look, it's Tuesday night. It's Birmingham. I feel I should talk about oral sex. <laughs> I, I don't actually give the orals anymore. <laughs> I, now, before you condemn, I mean, the occasional peck on the Majora, but I... <laughs> visit the inner folds. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm not squeamish. Some men are quite squeamish about it. I, in fact, I read in Marie Claire that there's a... It's good. There's a thing called... Um, some men have a thing called clitorophobia, right? <laughs> Which, in case you're wondering, is not an irrational fear of the Lancashire town of Clitheroe. <laughs> scared some men, it's amazing, they're scared of the female, um, I don't like the word, the, the, cl the clitoris. <laughs> they're scared of the clitoris, that, that's not my problem. In fact, I'd say nowadays that's one of the few things in a hood that I'm not scared of. <laughs> now, my thing is, I found that no matter how sweet-natured and lovely a woman is, 
When you start giving them the orals, they go through a bit of a character change, right? They get quite bossy and actually aggressive. You know who you are, right? And some of them will bark out instructions, right? It's, it's what I call uh, the play your cards right approach. They're going higher, lower, stick. I don't mind that, right? I object to having my ears held. <laughs> I would never do that to a woman. I, I don't think it's safe for a start off. Some women, I can see blokes nodding, yes. <laughs> I, honestly, I have given some women the oils. It's like they've been pleasured by a small steering wheel. one Brazilian Grand Prix. <laughs> and this is, play, this is not new for me. The second time I gave the orals, right, the, the second time, I was a teenager, inexperienced, you know. I had no technique to speak of, but I was giving it my best shot. You know, I was with a woman only three years older than me, right, and I was but beavering away. <laughs> <I> was gonna... <laughs> and suddenly she, she yanked my head upwards, right? And, I had a pain go all down this side. <laughs> and I'll remember what she said if I live to be a hundred, right? She, she, went, she went, oi. <laughs> Which you don't want when you're trying to be sensual. <laughs> but it, it got worse. She, she said, oi, she said, stick to the shallow end. <laughs> I did. I said, I'm out of here. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> I added that bit. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, don't get me wrong. I'll talk when I'm receiving the orals, but I would never dream of giving instructions. I don't think any man would dare to, right? I talk basically just, just to take their minds off it more than anything else. I'm always worried it might suddenly dawn on them, you know, what, what they're doing. <laughs> I have to say, I wouldn't blame any woman for doing that. I bet you now there is not a bloke in here tonight who has not at some point when receiving the orals, right, who has not looked down and gone... <laughs> would you suit me? <laughs> How many... <laughs> Women recognise this, right? Women, especially with slightly longer hair. You know, you know when a man lies on the bed, like, aching for the orals, right? And you very kindly oblige, and you lean over him, right? And after a bit, he does that thing when he draws back the hair like a curtain. <laughs> I'm sure some women think, you know, well, how lovely. Of this animalistic act, he's still intent to gaze upon the face of the woman he loves. <laughs> Whereas the bloke is almost always thinking, well, scenes believe him. <laughs> she is actually sucking my co <laughs> I am so insecure by nature that whenever I draw back the hair curtain, right, I always half expect to see the woman there with a cantaloupe with a hole in it. <laughs> Get out, you've betrayed me. <laughs> oh, uh, leave the cantaloupe. <laughs> I don't want you to think, though, that I'm laddish. I'm really not laddish about it, right? I, I actually think of myself as a very sensitive lover, right? Uh, no, I do. Uh, I tell you what, I, I, tell you, I don't like... You know, sometimes the man stands and the woman kneels. I always have a problem with the kneeling thing, right? I don't, I don't know where to put my hands for a start off, right? Has it been quite so bad since I took up the banjo? <laughs> See what you think? I'm interested what women think about this. I've always thought it's a nice thing to, to sort of gently 
stroke the hair. Is that nice? Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a sweet thing to do, isn't it, I think? You can learn from that, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> Never pat, though. <laughs> they, uh, I find they don't like that. And also, I think that they think you might be used to getting it from the dog. Likewise, when you do finally come, never give them a biscuit. <laughs> no, it's true, I think, for men and women, I think this is, this is the truth of it, that sometimes you get blowjobs that just go on forever. You know those ones? The woman is there and, and her lips are stinging and swollen. Right? She's like, oh, on. Oh, oh. <laughs> senses it and he's thinking, oh, who can I think about now? <laughs> well, I was in one of those, right? I'd started off very, very focused, stroking the air tenderly. After about 10 minutes, I, my mind had wandered, right? <laughs> and uh, when I eventually snapped out of it, I looked down, I'd, I'd absentmindedly put a couple of plats in. <laughs> for elastics. <laughs> and some blokes, bear in mind they're already getting the orals, right? They'll, what they'll do, they'll, they'll reach down and, and, and fondle the breasts, right? They're already getting the orals. <laughs> Greedy. <laughs> and like, oh, yeah. Who says we can't multitask? <laughs> That, no, I'm sure women have worked out that there's a thing about a bloke and breasts, right? Once you let them know that they can, they will, right? Doesn't matter when. A bloke can come in from work looking very distressed, right? Genuinely upset. And his wife or girlfriend will say, uh, have you had a bad day at the office? And he'll say, oh, man, it's not working out for me there. I had a big argument with Steve in sales. And I think it might be time for a bit of a career change. <laughs> Because this, I'm starting to get depressed about it. <laughs> what are you doing? Some blokes, they can be having sex from behind even, right? Sex from behind, and that's not enough for them. They have to think, well, I, I can reach. <laughs> I never do that, right? First of all, it gets me right in the small of the back. <laughs> but also, I did it once, and uh, I, I, I reached forward to, to fondle. And uh, the woman, I think, thought I'd lean forward to whisper, right? And she, she looked, you know, she looked back. <laughs> and I felt obliged to come up with something. <laughs> I said, um, so, um, how's it going at your end? Is there anyone in tonight who's kind of in a new relationship, you know, less than a year, just sort of got together? Where are you? Oh, someone there. What, what's your name? Jackie. L Locky. <laughs> you named after a family pet. <laughs> it's Locky as in L-U-C-K-Y. I'm so, oh, short for Luck Vinder, right? I'm, that, I can still do jokes about it. <laughs> easy with it now, it's fine. So is that, is, is that your boyfriend next to you there? Okay, what's your name? Amajit, right? When did you, when did you two get together? Just got married. You just got married? How long have you been together? You met last week. <laughs> oh, come on. She left, he left. Obviously, I'm dead after. <laughs> How long have you been together? A year and a half. Now, how did you meet? It was arranged. It was arranged. Brilliant, right? Did you, when you first got together, how did I know that? It's mystical. When you first got together, did you used to text each other a lot? Yeah. yeah because I read a thing in the paper that said the biggest change in, in new relationships in, it's in the 21st century is the text message, right, that that's how you communicate. Did you find it sort of a, a good way of communicating emotions? Or was your parents, did they do it better? <laughs> 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 
No, I, people don't believe this, but I talk... I've got, like, you know, young relatives and that, and they do, I said when I first started having a relationships, right, there was no texting. They don't believe you. No texting, no mobile phones, you know. In, in, in Albury, there was no phones. <laughs> You know when you're in a new relationship and you get the text message and you get all excited, you think this could be from them, this could be from them. I was like that when I saw a pigeon. <laughs> but I think texting does make new relationships a bit more stressful and I didn't need anything that made new relationships more stressful because I have to confess to you now, this is a serious confession. When I first start going out with someone, I become a complete not case, right? Now, yes. some of you may be able to, to identify with this, I don't know, but I get madly jealous, madly insecure, madly obsessed, right? Lucky, you said you leaned across to... Is he the same? Yeah. No, it's... Honestly, I, I become a different person, and, you know, it's not nice. And I just want to try and give you an insight tonight into that person that I become, and it isn't pleasant, right? So, this is what I'm like. I've met the woman, say, six days earlier, right? All I'm thinking about is her, that's all I think about. And I'm living to get the text message. And I get a text message, and it says something like, your granddad's been taken into hospital. I think, I think oh shit, it's not from her. <laughs> and then I finally get a text message from her, and it might just say something like, uh, I hope you're having a lovely day. And I think, oh man, she hopes I'm having a lovely day, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I, even though I've only known her six days, I have an image of her in a hospital bed, covered in sweat, having just given birth to our first child. <laughs> And I'm saying to her, you did it, darling. She said, no, no, we did it, Frank. And I'm thinking about that image, and I'm reading the text, and I think about the image, and I read the text probably 70 or 80 times, right? And then eventually I think, hold on a minute, where's the fucking kiss? <laughs> and I start scrolling down as if the kiss might somehow be trapped at the bottom of the phone, but there is no kiss, right? So I send her a text message back, and it says something like, yes, I'm having a lovely day. In fact, I'm just on my way out. No kiss, fuck you, right? <laughs> I'm just on my way out, but I need to get a pint of milk. But I want to leave it a bit vague, because I want it to go round and round her head, right? And she'll be thinking, oh, we might go to some trendy pub. There'll be young women there. One thing will lead to another. And she'll spend the night with any luck, at least, at least in tears. And hopefully, actually vomiting with anxiety, right? But that's right. What goes around comes around, you no kiss, bitch. <laughs> about two weeks, I get brave enough to actually phone, and I phone, and I get the answer phone, and I think, oh, that's it, her phone's off. She's obviously fucking someone else. <laughs> and the voice comes in, and it says something like, uh, oh, sorry, I can't take your call right now. I think, no, you can't take my call, but you can take someone else's stiff cock. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope he's dripping with AIDS. <laughs> and then I realise I actually left that last bit on her answer phone. <laughs> Next time I see her, she says, that was a weird message you left on my answer phone. And I say, yeah, I wasn't talking to you, it was an accident. I was talking to a mate of mine who was anticipating the arrival of a hearing aid salesman. And I said, I hope he brings lots of stock for you to choose from. In fact, I hope he's dripping with AIDS. And she said, what did your friend say? I said, he didn't hear me, he's deaf. And I with a woman and she gets a text message and she reads it and she doesn't let you read it as well. And they do that kind of sniggle and they go, <laughs> and you know two things. One, it's filth and two, they fucking love it, right? <laughs> I was with a woman once and she got a text message. I leaned right back to read it over her shoulder. It said, thank you for my birthday present, exclamation mark, Steve. And I thought, yeah, we all know what the fucking birthday present was. <laughs> and the exclamation mark clearly meant to represent her vagina and anus. <laughs> Jealousy is a bad thing. People say to me, jealousy, it's like cancer, isn't it? In a way, it's worse than cancer, right? Because at least with cancer, you do get some sympathy. Whereas if I go out with a mate and I say to him, I've been seeing this woman for about a week and I think she might be seeing someone else. So when she went to the toilet the other night, I went through her handbag and started reading her diary. I know he'll just look at me, right? Three days later, he's not going to phone up and say, I was telling the gang about your jealousy and we've had a whip round. We're going to send you to Disneyland. <laughs> When Kylie Minogue was diagnosed with cancer, she got half a million Get Well cards. Six months later, her boyfriend, Olivier Martinez, was seen snogging Penelope Cruz. Poor Kylie was crippled with jealousy. How many cards did she get then? One from me saying, you're on your own, Baldy. <laughs> Sometimes she's going to be talking to a woman and she'll say, oh, I was chatting to this guy at work. I don't hear the rest of the sentence. She was chatting to a guy at work. She was chatting to a guy at work. I have an image of the guy at work, right? He looks like Johnny Depp. He's in a white shirt and a tie. He's leaning forward, supporting himself with his left hand on the toilet system. With his right hand, he's wanking like a gibbon. <laughs> she kneeling behind him, thrilled. No, no, honoured to be tonguing out his arse. <laughs> So just accept that. And then that night, to compound my humiliation, she comes around my house and kisses me, so I too must die on his filth. So, 
in order to even things up a bit, I have to start seeing prostitutes. And I'm in the back seat of my car with a 16-year-old Ugandan sex slave sucking my guilt trunk maggot of a penis. And I'm thinking to myself, talking to some guy at work, two could play at this game. The only text you can send me early on in a relationship has to say, I absolutely, totally love you with no doubt whatsoever. Kiss, 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 kiss. When I get that text, I will run around my flat punch in the air and whooping with absolute delight for about three minutes and then I start thinking, actually, this is too much too soon. <laughs> Do you think this bit would work better if I accompanied it with the theme music from Simon Bates's Our Tune? <laughs> no, you're probably right. So, um, the point I'm trying to make is that when I'm in a new relationship, I become a bit of a knockcase. And um, obviously, I've exaggerated it a little bit for effect. I definitely don't start um, seeing prostitutes for revenge. That would be a terrible thing to do. I feel I know you well enough now to say that I've been with two prostitutes in my life. One when I was 17, didn't know any better, and one when I was drinking a lot and, you know, my life was out of control. She actually was Ugandan, but she definitely wasn't a 16-year-old uh, sex life. She was about 45 and uh, actually quite aggressive. <laughs> you should have heard her language when I said this should cover it and gave her the fishing rod. It was a lie. It was about 40 quid, actually. <laughs> I saw her the next night, she was on a fucking tractor. <laughs> We're going to be a fabulous crowd tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Good night. What happened to that nasty man so pally with the Taliban? Oh, 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 Osama Bin Laden. I believe you promised to buy this. He had one big hit, then he went away like a terrorism, Macy Gray. Oh, 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 Osama Bin Laden. He occasionally sends out a videotape to say he's doing great and he's full of hate. Well, if he's doing so great, then please tell me why a videotape, not a DVD. <laughs> you might think that he's wicked and depraved, but think of him stuck in that fucking cave. He takes girls back there now and then, but the clerics just throw stones at them. Oh, 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 Osama Bin Laden. All music's banned by the Taliban, so he always misses the ice cream ban. Oh, 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 Osama Bin Laden. Taliban TV ain't got a lot of laughs in. Their biggest show is called Strictly No Dancing. To his parties anymore, it's like being Michael Barrymore. <laughs> oh, 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 Osama Bin Laden. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very much. I don't normally do this bit, but you know, it's Birmingham. <laughs> Leave them on a song, that's what you're supposed to do, but ah, oh, fuck it. <laughs> oh dear, so what else? Oh yeah, one thing I didn't tell you um, is that um, the, the thing about being 50 is, that I, you know, the things that it's changed. 
One of the things it's changed is uh, I don't do the um, pornography anymore. <laughs> now it's true because at 50, no, I know it's, it's a shock. It was something I hoped would be a comfort in my old age. But <laughs> I find now, um, I just feel bad about it. If I'm looking at the internet, you know, there's women on there in their early 20s and stuff. It just feels, yes. right. you know, I, I feel bad about it. I can't look myself in the mirror, you know, and if I do, I lose my erection immediately. <laughs> But then, I had a brilliant idea. I switched to granny porn. <laughs> Don't condemn until you've seen it yourself. It's honestly, there's something wonderful about it, right? Stretch marks, facial hair, hip operation scar just above the stocking top. Suddenly, I felt respectable. <laughs> It's a secret world, but there's something lovelier about it than you might think, right? You, get, you might get a, a, a woman there in her late 70s lying on a sofa wearing just stockings and suspenders, right? And I see that and I think, how marvellous. <laughs> that an old age pensioner can afford to have the heating on that high. <laughs> They seem such lovely women, right? And they all seem like they're having a, a fabulous time. I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out, you know, when, when, when they've had a bit of a rinse after there's a cup of tea and a biscuit waiting and they have a nice day out, right? And they seem lovely. And for example, if I was in a club, right, in Birmingham tonight and I saw a, a female porn star who was like in her early 20s, I would never dream of going up to her and saying something like, you know, I've got a DVD with you on, because I imagine she'd be a bit unfriendly, you know, and a bit snooty. Whereas if it was one of the women from Granny Porn and I said, I've got a DVD with you on, she'd probably offer to knit me a cover for it. <laughs> Honestly, try it. I think, I think you might like it. And, uh, no, really, uh, it, there, there are all sorts of advantages you'd never think of. For example, uh, in, in ordinary pornography, it's very difficult to get a close-up shot that includes the vagina and nipples. <laughs> Whereas in granny porn, they are much more adjacent. <laughs> now, I don't, want to, I don't want to stereotype these women, because some of them have got lovely per pointy breasts. No, really, not, not unlike Samosas. There's a sort of an Indian food theme that runs through granny porn, because a lot of the women have got quite pale, wrinkled, dry skin with areas of brown mottling. And apparently this is how we get the phrase nan bread. <laughs> no, I didn't know that either. Wikipedia, right? So. It's a marvellous thing. So what I'd like to do before, before we go is I'm just going to give you a few examples of... I, I mean, I don't have clips. I'm just going to tell you about them. <laughs> uh, things that I've seen in granny porn, and then I think you'll know why I love it so. Right? Um, I saw one now, uh, and it was a, it was a woman... I, I bet she was 80, right? And, and you know when women get the shaky head, the old women? You know that? <laughs> Well, she had the shaky head, and it was a, it was a, a blowjob scene, right? <laughs> and they never put them with old men, they put them with quite young, good-looking men, so you get the contrast. And this guy was there, and I could see he was, he was struggling with the moving target. <laughs> he couldn't quite coordinate, you know, and it was... If you've ever watched anybody with a hangover thread a needle, you, you, you know the kind of thing. <laughs> but when it switched to the hand job, she just held on tight and nature took its course. It was... <laughs> Fantastic. Another one now, now this was, I saw one of the old girls, she went on top, right? Which doesn't happen very often. I didn't, I couldn't really enjoy it because I was, I feared she might topple. <laughs> but it was a lovely bit because, like I say, they're old women and even in pornography, they're still quite cute and lovable, right? And when she got on top, right, and when she was getting ready, it was like watching somebody get into a very hot bath. Right? <laughs> She's like, oh, oh. Now your hearts are starting to melt. <laughs> you can see what I like of I saw one woman, right, again about 70, and she was having sex with this young guy. And with each thrust, right, she was going, oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. And then, and then she went, oh, smash him. <laughs> Right. And this 
first of all, now this is quite rare in, in granny porn. There, there was an anal sex scene, right? <laughs> uh, it's a risk. <laughs> You're more than a can of worms, that's fine. <laughs> but there was a brilliant... Honestly, this was such a heartwarming moment, even in that context, right? Because at the point of entrance, just as the folk entered, the woman went, whoops. <laughs> And if, I, honestly, if this, is the, oh, this is the last one, but it's, it's the best thing I ever saw in Granny Porn. If there was a, if there was a Desert Island Granny Porn programme, this would be the one I'd choose as my, as my special moment, right? It was, um, it was a, a, a woman who was, uh, I'd say she was late 70s, right? And she was with this guy, very, uh, very good-looking Latino kind of young man, very chiselled physique. And it was another blowjob scene, right? And she was, one of the nice things about the old women is that I think older people, they, they don't take sex as seriously as, as the young do, and they, like, they have a bit of fun, you know. And I love them for that, right? And this, the, the young guy was very sombre and serious, and she was doing the blowjob. And she was looking up quite a lot, you know. <laughs> and um, I personally don't like that when I'm, when I'm receiving. I don't, I don't like it when they, it makes me very self-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, I don't like. It's a bit. That's why I never get oral sex from a horse. Because <laughs> the eyes are just there, you know. And, <laughs> or Amy Winehouse for the same reason. <laughs> she didn't remember. No, I don't, I don't like being looked up at when I'm receiving. I, I feel that I have to look like I'm having a brilliant time for morale. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Occasionally, I'll go. <laughs> anyway, this old woman was, was looking up at this guy and uh, doing the blowjob. And then out of nowhere, I thought this was... Honestly, I laughed about this for about a month, right? I'd just be sitting on my own and occasionally go... <laughs> <laughs> and she was giving him the blowjob. And then, brilliantly, she suddenly went... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Recognise the tune. <laughs> it was American Patrol by the Glenn Miller Orchestra. I had a lovely image of her as a young woman jitterbogging with a handsome GI. <laughs> but this, um, this handsome young Latino guy didn't even smile. Didn't was really miserable about it. Probably worried about how he was going to get the smell of mint humbugs off his helmet. <laughs> oh, come back now. You've been great tonight. Thank you very much. Cheers.